Hello, welcome back to Scottish Independence Podcasts. This week we have an extended interview with Colin Fox, who's the convener of the Scottish Socialist Party. We did interview Colin a couple of months ago for another show we were doing, which was how non-SNP groups were looking at the SNP's independence strategy, so it was very specific. We probably used 15 minutes worth or so from the interview in that show, but the conversation we actually had with Colin was much longer than that and really interesting and we didn't want to lose that just because we'd you'll have seen a couple of the clips earlier maybe so this is just that extended interview that we had with colin i think you'll you'll enjoy listening to a committed passionate socialist we we hope you enjoy this um this conversation with colin um because we did thoroughly enjoy it another scottish independence podcast and i'm really pleased to welcome well, yourself, Colin, to be with us uh, today, and mm-hmm. we wanted to get to out to people who are, you know, not in the SNP, and yeah. uh, maybe, maybe. Well, fair in, play in... to you for being so democratic and including everybody. <laughs> Quite right. Yeah. To do. More, more power to your elbow. Yeah. Well, we're not, we're yeah. not party political when it comes to the podcast, so we just well, we I'm just on, support I'm only one party political. I'm only one party political, so I'm just behind you. <laughs> Just kick us off. What, what what did you think yourself about that debate at the SNP conference? I mean, do you think it is a you know basically we're interested in talking about routes to independence and and they've come mm-hmm. up with with something and given that we're pretty stymied with all the kind of no 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 that comes out of Westminster. What what, what did you think about yourself? Well, I, I welcome that. I mean, I think there's a great deal of thought has got to get into. We've got some fairly profound challenges in front of us. You know how we're going to get independence, how we're going to get a majority for independence, how we're going to overcome the obstacles that are put in our way. So whatever contributions to that debate that are offered, then I think we're all duty bound to listen, to hear, to learn, swap ideas. I didn't find it particularly persuasive, but you know, it's not unwelcome because of that. The more yeah. people are thinking about this, the more likely we're going to come up with some solutions. So. I, I take my hat off to you for following it. It's another one of these um, process discussions, but the process, yeah. while it's not, it's not, not the be all and end all. I still think the most important question is how we're going to get a majority because we don't have a majority yet. But once we get that majority, then this process of how we're going to secure independence is, is an extremely important debate, and you don't often get many brownie points for leaving considerations like that way down the track you've got to have them in the forefront of your mind all the time so yeah. you know I, I'm, I'm interested in it I'm obviously I'm a partisan and as much as the Scottish Socialist Party's been in favour of independence now for 25 years which means we've not had it yet so we're as impatient as anybody else so yeah I, I think those discussions that to be honest with you Marlene and Fiona they've been few and far between actually mm. and the discussions have got a great deal of questions to answer and a great deal of more thoughts to get into them to if we're going to be you know finding a persuasive not so much for those of us who support independence as it is but that you know elusive majority that don't yet share our point of view so yes welcome the polls showing that independence is still kind of 50 50 and that seems to be decoupling itself from support for the SNP and where is that support going? Because it doesn't appear to be appearing under the other independence parties polling either. And I'd be very surprised yeah, I mean, if it's That's the great paradoxical move. question just now. I mean, I think support for independence is probably still about 45%, but support for the SNP is down about 10 or 12%. So the question is, how can support for the SNP be down 12 and support for independence have remained where it was? And I think you're forced to draw the conclusion that that probably means that a big proportion of those people in Scotland who support independence are thinking of voting Labour. That's where the SNP support has gone. It's unfortunately yeah. not yet gone to the SSP. It's not gone to the Greens as far as I can see. So the SNP yeah. support seems to be travelling over to the Labour Party. People who are supporting Labour and who support independence are facing both ways at once. They're trying to ride the horse forwards and backwards simultaneously. Yeah. And there was some polling that um, Gordon McIntyre Kemp from Believe in Scotland was talking about, and he said when when they were looking at it, they couldn't tell the difference 
other than on the constitutional question between independent supporters, SNP supporters and Labour supporters. In terms of social values, they were pretty much the same. And it really was, it came down to that question of, well, how best do you think we can get there? I don't know. I mean, uh, the more that Starmer, it, the more he travels to the right and the more he just takes up the mantle of this muscular unionism, I don't understand why anybody in Scotland would vote for them other than yeah. just to give the SNP a kick in. Well, that, that's for us all to answer. I mean, my, my take on it is that the principal support for Labour is an anti-Tory vote. It's yeah. not pro-Starmer, it's not pro Annie yeah. Sarwar or Jackie Bailey. It's people are sick to the back teeth of yeah. the cost of living crisis that they attribute to the Tories. They've been in for 14 years. They're, you know, the behaviour of Boris Johnson, Liz Truss as individuals, I mean, they they, they represent what the Conservative Party is. They were the Prime Ministers. And the record was so disgraceful that they gave all politics a bad name. So I think the Tories are absolutely heading for a, a doing, as we say in the West of Scotland, when I grew up <laughs> next year. But I have to yeah. say, that's very much a mixed blessing because we're heading for the most right-wing Labour government in my lifetime. Yeah, we're past yeah. What we're heading for. This is yeah. more I mean right-wing than Blair, even. Yes, I mean, although, I mean, I can well understand those of us here in Scotland, people who were thinking about voting Labour, especially if we're older rather than younger, well, yeah, I don't know, over 50, something like that, you think, oh, well, it's very similar values. And, you know, in a way, that, that there's, that's true, but that's true, but it's only true of what the Labour Party used to stand for and mm. it doesn't seem to be true for what they're coming out with at the moment. You know, these by-elections that have happened, well, there's been the one in Rutherglen and but also there's been a few council by-elections, is it? Yeah. It seems that it's the SNP vote is, is just not, it's staying at home. The Labour numbers of, in the votes, yeah, they're getting a much bigger percentage of the vote, but the actual numbers of votes being cast isn't shifting very much. And I mean, you have to give them credit because they've got their vote out and the SNP didn't get theirs out. But it looks like it's, I'm just staying at home, not going to do it. I mean, maybe that yeah. would be different if there's, when there comes to an actual election than an actual, um, you know, campaign that's going. But I don't know. It's a good point. I mean, when you consider, brother, when there was a by-election in my hometown of Motherwell last Thursday, and what was significant wasn't the result, meaningless. The, what was significant is the turnout was just 20%. The turnout, I mean, you, the three of us went through the referendum where, the interest in politics was sky high. We had 80% turnout in that referendum. What's happened is interest in politics has greatly diminished. In a, in a by-election in Motherwell, a place like Motherwell, as if Motherwell hasn't got enough problems to get people up and at them about, yet only 20% of people vote in a council election. The turnout in uh, Rutherglen and Hamilton uh, West, as you mentioned, again, was terrible. Yeah. And it's a reflection of those people... Often they're the poorest, they're the most divorced from politics, they don't follow it particularly well, they know, you know, that they just feel as if they're getting constantly pressed upon, their standard of living is getting worse and worse, their education system is getting worse and worse, the justice system is getting worse and worse, and they just walk away because they don't have any faith in any, any of the political parties to do it. And I think yeah. that's, that's principally what the SNP are suffering from. Not just that people have gone to Labour, a proportion of transferred to Labour, a bigger proportion of our support have lost all faith in them, not turning yeah. out at all. Yeah. We certainly got that impression. We were in Rutherglen before the, the by-election, just talking yeah. to people in the street, and, th and that came through loud and strong, was apathy, yeah. which was very difficult. We did we had a great chat with um, one of your guys, actually, and I cannot remember his name, which is awful, but he was a lovely, um, very articulate... A socialist uh, with no name. Socialism, I'm sure he's got a name, but I, I wasn't. You don't, don't use names, it's a bourgeois concept. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was very, he was very he was persuasive very and very eloquent, actually. Uh, there was nothing he said that we disagreed with, nothing at all that he put forward, yeah. and he was putting it forward very well. So what, what, do you, what do you guys hear on the street? I was in Rutherglen five or six times, and the main thing was the cost of living crisis. And funny enough, the first question we started this conversation with was about the process of how we're going to get independence. And, you know, the SNP conference theme seemed to be, at least Hamza and Stephen were saying, 
we're going to make next year's general election a de, fact, a de facto referendum. And the trouble they've got there is the main issue next year's general election will be the cost of living crisis. It won't be independence. It won't yeah. be Ukraine. It won't be climate change even. It'll be the cost of living crisis. And therefore, if you're trying to jump on the basis of saying make independence the issue that people will consider where they're going to place their vote, you've got an uphill struggle because that's not where their attention is based. It was the same in Rutherland. The price of the rent, the price of petrol, yeah. the price of things they can no longer easily afford. So I'm sure that was the case in Motherwell last Thursday. And that's the link that I think all the parties seem to be failing to make at the moment. It's, it's, and it's not the how of independence, it's the why. And it's the link that those issues with the cost of living and everything else, independence will somehow improve that situation. That seems to be asking people to take a huge leap of faith right now. Now, I don't know if you get to the point where they think I've got nothing to lose, might as well do it. Perhaps that's somewhere we no, get I think, to. I, I think that especially for socialists like us, you know, what I try to do and what we try to do in Rutherglen was to link the fact that the cost of living crisis, that issue pertains to what kind of country do you want to live in? It's about change. And yeah. running through the sort of independence debate, like that stock of rock famously, you know, Millport running through the middle <laughs> of the stock of rock, is the question that we, all of us in the independence movement, have got to address, which is, is independence about change or is it not? Mm -hmm. And how much change is it about? Because I think I would say to you, I've debated with people, for example, Mike Russell for the SNP. Uh, I remember a, a meeting in Grangemouth about, I don't know, a year ago, something like that. And Mike at that stage was arguing this was the start of the Indy Ref 2 campaign. But his basic premise was, no, no, independence won't mean much change. We'll keep the Queen, we'll keep the pound, we'll keep things, mm -hmm. stability, this kind of thing. And I was saying, Mike, that's the antithesis of what people want to hear. They want to hear independence is about profound change. It's going to change the hideous inequalities in Scotland that sees a third of our kids in Glasgow going to bed every night hungry. It's mm -hmm. about addressing the hideous housing problem. That means, you know, uh, Marlene's talking about reference there, people under 50. How do people under 50 get their own house now? Yeah. I mean, the average house price in Edinburgh is soaring towards 350, 400,000 pound a year. If you're mm -hmm. earning 20,000, 25,000 pound a year, how does that work? Where are you going to get a mortgage for 15 or 20 times your salary. Yeah. Either you do it fiddle de dee as they corruptly did and less led to the crisis, financial crash of 2008 and 9, where the, the mortgage companies lied about all of that and brought it to its knees. Or you're, you're left high and dry. You're, you know, you're floundering around in the rental, the private rental market, paying a fortune for a squalid tenement flat in Edinburgh, of which there are mm. too many. So there's these profound questions and independence either changes that or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we never win. So the, the SNP conference, the, the one thing that all the people we spoke to seemed to be genuinely quite excited by was the idea of this constitutional convention. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, we've had the Scottish Independence Convention. We obviously had the Yes movement. And I think there's an appreciation that we are stronger united we're stronger together the snp can't do this in their own mm -hmm. i wouldn't suggest to you the scottish socialist party can do it on its own and that's probably widely understood and easily seen but the same applies to the snp yeah. the snp can't do this in their own they have mm -hmm. to reach out and, and i would say in all candor and i want to be honest with you they've not done sufficient reaching out since 2015 when they got all these mps elected and I, I find sometimes their attitude towards the rest of us outside the SNP rather dismissive, rather haughty. Well, you don't have representatives in Parliament, so your point of view is not worthwhile. You don't speak for a constituency, etc., etc. And they have to sometimes be brought back down. You know what they say, pride cometh before a fall. Mm. And I fear the SNP are going to lose half their seats in Scotland next year. And yeah. whether that's welcome or not, people can make up their own mind. But I hope it leads to a a regard that says we know now we can't do it on our own. I'm long enough in the tooth to remember when the SNP strategy for independence was that if we ever got a majority of seats at Westminster in Scotland, then that was in effect a yeah. UDI. And yeah. then they got them 
they got what 56 or 59 and they couldn't get it but i support the idea of a single referendum a single question answer it straight let us you know be a black and white choice not wrapping it up in a general election which is wrapped in trident and you know cost of living crisis and gaza and ukraine and climate change mm -hmm. and this well, a single question with profound implications and you take the decision that was right i supported that in 2014 when we had it and i still support that's the route we get it yeah the challenge for us is we've got to get a majority that supports it and if we get a majority it unlocks the key to every other obstacle that's put in our way what i'm picking up reading reading around this the uh, situation and also what was said at that snp conference you know everyone agrees that that at some point that's got to happen again right it's we got to have a rerun again but of course it's kind of like how do you do it if we, mm -hmm. if you can't if you can't get an equivalent of the you know the edinburgh agreement 2012 was it you know if we can't get that again and from Westminster's point of view, why would they? Because they know them, they're pretty likely to, to lose this time. So, it's, you know, if you can't get that, how do we get that up? How do we get that going? And what what, what answer me, have you come up with, Marlene? What, well, I haven't. Ha that well, that's it. That, that's trouble. <laughs> that kind of happened. But I'll tell you, I was really kind of struck when I heard it was Joanna Cherry who, put, who spoke for the motion set up. Scottish Constitutional Convention, but what mm -hmm. struck me about it was she, that she was proposing, and you know, it was accepted, that it was that convention that would be empowered to negotiate with Westminster. And it's mm -hmm. not just going to be SN, obviously it's not just SNP, people who will be in it. And she made a point of saying, whatever MSPs, MPs want to be on it can be on it, plus Civic Scotland, plus representatives of smaller indie parties who yeah, at the moment yeah. may may or may not have their own representatives actually in Holyrood or, or elsewhere. And I thought that's a step that needed to be taken because as you say, there's been a bit too much of we're the ones who'll make it who'll make, you know, from the SNP, I mean SNP think um we're the ones that will make it happen. And to be fair, they probably still are the ones that will make it happen. Mm -hmm. But but in in conjunction with others so I, that's not really an answer to your question no no but, but i think yeah i'll come back to the i'll try and answer your direct question in a second but joanna's very wise woman i mean she's exhibited that in a number of ways but on this occasion she's exhibiting it that the scottish independence convention or the constitutional convention let, let me give you a secret i don't think i've mentioned this ever before so here's an exclusive, an exclusive. <laughs> uh, run up to 2014 discussions took place i mean i was on the advisory board as you know nicola sturgeon sat next day as patrick harvey was there pat kane elaine c smith i'm sure you remember the personnel and i was approached in uh, ahead of the referendum uh, by alex salmon's team and they said look if we get a majority for independence then there will need to be a group of us who negotiate on behalf of the British state what independence means, the assets and liabilities be shared out. That could be a process that could take a couple of years. I mean, we're candid about it then. It would be a, it would be yeah. a process of how much of the London Underground belongs to Scotland. I mean, it was our money that built it as much as others. Anyway, th those are details. And I remember getting assurances at the time it was it was understood that you wouldn't talk about this openly because you could be very you could be found guilty of putting cats before a horse but you know and i have to say personally i was never confident they were ever going to win that referendum but nonetheless we still had to prepare if we did win it what would be the consequences who would be the negotiating team and it was clear that the scottish socialist party would have a, let me put it this way we would have a seat in the train that contained the negotiators going down to London to sit at Whitehall or wherever, and we would be part of that negotiating team. And I think that was the right thing to do then. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna's um, proposition today, the same theme. It's the same, let yeah. a thousand flowers bloom. We've all got to be part of this. We've all got to sell it. You know, you, it's one thing to win the referendum, it's another to get an agreement with the negotiations that come out. I mean, I'm a great, uh, I've watched, you know, Michael Collins and the process they went through in Irish independence where Collins was sent 
well, a lion to the slaughter by yeah. De Valera to go and negotiate by the, you know, for the Irish, the supporters of Irish independence. And he came back with a treaty that meant they had the North and they didn't get rid of the monarchy and things like that. So that illustrates the fact that once you've got the vote, then you've got the rather laborious process of saying, right, how much of the money? What happens to this? What happens to that? But since your question was about Joanna's proposition, I'm entirely behind that. That has to be the approach yeah. that we all buy into independence. I've got profound differences with the SNP. I don't support the monarchy. I'm a socialist and not a capitalist. We could be here and I'll give you a long list. But if we are arguing for independence, we do so on the basis that we can all benefit from this. And yeah. therefore, all the beneficiaries are entitled to be there at the negotiating table saying, this is what we want, you know. So yeah. that's, that's important. My other point was just I'd asked Marlene, you know, point blank, what is the answer to the problem? They want a second referendum in Westminster have told us you're not going to get it. So how are we going to get it? And I, and I think we should be clear, if we're heading for a Labour government next year, Labour are as unionist as the Tories. Labour are as opposed to Scottish independence as anybody else in these aisles. And I, I can say I was a member of the Labour Party for the first 10 years of my political life, when I was a novice, when I was an adolescent, when I didn't know any better. But the answer to the question is, we have to make Westminster an offer they can't refuse. We need to have majority support and we say we have the majority, we speak on the behalf of the majority and what follows is that we're entitled to mobilise that majority both through parliament and through extra parliamentary activities. I say that because I was also one of the veterans of the anti-poll tax campaign, mm. the greatest civil disobedience yeah. in recent years yeah. resulted in a success. I'm hearing more and more in different places that is surfacing up. And I think it's a it's a result of us other routes being closed off to us. We were listening to the RIC conference not so long ago. It's quite a lot of discussion there. Marlene Pleasure. and I are, are, were just back from um, the Festival of Survival in Glasgow, which oh, yeah, was a joint was conference. Was were you? Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. What a great day. And yeah, I just thought, look at the, the spread of different people there. Yeah, you know, civic international people, and you know, some of the some of the discussion was all very worthy, but there was a, there was other bits that, that that really was quite. We really need to get in here and start making ourselves annoying. And there was a fabulous <laughs> quote which I just loved from I think it was Melissa Park, who's the head of ICANN now, and she said, "Anybody who thinks that they're too small to make a difference." hasn't spent a night in a tent with a mosquito. Or a midgie. Or a midgie. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. This is Scotland. You know, yeah. our midgies are our national weapon. Yeah. If we yeah. all became midgies, how annoying could we be? Yeah, yeah um, exactly. So, I think so, she's right. So, and seeing that theme, uh, who on earth, you know, I, I look at you and you're both experienced enough to recognise the wisdom. And I think it's Tony Benn who said, it's a fool, a great fool who would underestimate the profound power in democracy. And so if there's a democratic majority in Scotland, it'd be very, very unwise for anybody to put their face against what the majority in this country wants to see. I mean, Scottish people are quite conservative with a small C. Sometimes they're slow to rouse. Sometimes they don't take to the streets and quickly the way I'd like them to see. But one thing they're adamant about is they will not tolerate their point of view being ignored. If they're in a majority, they expect to see that majority being delivered. And that's a, I mean, that's something I'm proud of in our yeah. culture. There are other cultures yeah. who would just say, nah, what can you do? Manana, manana, leave it or just walk away. Scotland's culture and our people have not got a tradition of just walking away. The poll tax is an example I mentioned before. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's going back to, well, not going back to, it's just stating where we are, isn't it? At the moment, yeah. we don't really have enough proof that there's a majority for independence. I mean, even if we say 50%, that's not enough. So no. what do you think the best ways are to get that up to 55 and above and keep it and keep it there? Because if we're at 55, we could do what you've just been saying. Yeah. No, now you're getting to the $64 million question, Marlene. Yeah. I mean, the fact yeah. of the matter is, I don't believe we're at 50%. I have to be honest with you. I wouldn't come on here okay. and flannel you. As you know, supporters of independence, we need to speak honestly to one another. 
And I, I think support for independence is well below 50%, 40, 45, somewhere around that order. And in, in a sense, it's not important whether it's 50 or 40. You're quite right. We need 60%. Yes. We need 60% because we don't want a result that says, well, best of three. You won the mm. first one narrowly. We won the second one narrowly. No, it needs to be a decisive. And it, it, that question and that issue reduces itself to, so how do we persuade the majority of people that independence is going to make them better off economically, politically, socially, and culturally. That's always been the question that we faced. And in my view, it's always been the question we've failed. And I, and I failed to get a majority on. And I respond to that as my grandmother and grandfather, you roll up your sleeves and you do the job better the next time. If the case isn't persuasive, then you work to make it more persuasive. You don't give up. And you don't think you can somehow wheedle 45 percent or become 60 by some dialectical extrapolation that Lenin might have referred to, whatever. We need to get a majority. And my feeling is it's there. It's possible to get a majority. We need to do a better, present a better case than we've done so far. People don't believe in our economic case. They don't believe in our economic case. They just think that, oh, you're just going to have the same inequalities in Edinburgh. You're going to have the same rich, rich so-and-sos that have big power and finance capital who treat people at their work miserably. The same powers that we will be in charge. And there's a sense that I don't know how we're going to get rid of this. And unless we get rid of it, unless that's what independence is about, then I'm not buying into it. In other words, mm -hmm. there has to be a profound shift in the way Scotland's wealth is currently distributed as well as created. And it has to mean that those who get insufficient share just now are catered for. So they give you one example, which I have to say disappointed me. During COVID, the Scot during and right after COVID, the Scottish Socialist Party's principal campaign was for a national care service in Scotland. Because we'd seen brokenheartedly so many people of our senior citizens had died in care homes and they were treated with insufficient care, they didn't have the attention, the care that they deserved. Those care homes were exposed, in my view, as being utterly inadequate, not just for a pandemic, but for the life that they were supposed to provide people. And so the call for a national care service, which had widespread support, not just for the Scottish Socialist Party, but it was predicated in the idea that it was genuinely, genuinely a comparator to the National Health Service and that it was going to be free at the point of need, paid for out of general taxation, and its standards of care provided that were befitting of the 21st century. And the debate somehow got paralysed and sidetracked the proposition to provide. I mean, I heard Nicola Sturgeon saying, we want a national care service like the National Health Service. Yeah. I mean, they delved, delved into it. He was offering no such thing. No such thing. It would still cost you a hundred and ten thousand pound a year for your care, if you were in North mm -hmm. Berwick or Edinburgh. The care, you know, the care that is provided nowhere near good enough for the twentieth century. Never mind the twenty-first century. So that's wrapped up in independence. It's got to be a question of saying independence has got to be about a national care service, a national health service that's fit for the twenty-first century, and holds to the prescription that an iron Bevan laid out in 1947, that this would be publicly owned. Edinburgh's got two of our NHS hospitals that are privately owned. The Royal Infirmary is owned by a PFI. The Sick Kids is owned by a company from Australia. They're not, they don't even own their own hospitals. That, I don't, I don't think for a second you can, you know, ignore the fact that public ownership is a big mainstay of why people support independence. Whether it's a constitutional convention or an independence convention, I could see there might be different things. If they coalesced around two or three big issues, and I think land reform could be something as well that, that yeah. gets people yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, NHS for sure, we've got Labour in the papers yesterday, I think, saying they'd be quite happy selling bits off or opening the door to the private sector which, again, labour, you know. So, you know, if we had four or five big-ticket items that could be the flagship of that that independence convention said, right, actually, this is why we need independence, rather than talking about it, you know, 
in democratic terms even say because this is these are things that let's do um i wonder if that could be more powerful than just i've got visions of it a lot of people coming to the table in good faith and then getting into a circular discussion about well, well you, know, you know what um, reminds me of fiona you know the debate about a written constitution the independence mm. movement's argument is we're in favor of scotland having a written constitution that lays down not so much that uh what we're for with independence but we put it and say this is what independence will mean we're putting down yeah. in a guarantee i realize you know constitutions are not uh, pound shillings and pence they're largely broad guarantees yeah. of the kind of kind of society we're going to build yeah. Yeah. but if we say that in a independent scotland in our constitution we have a commitment to the understanding that public ownership means that it's a universally provided service that everybody benefits from. Yeah. That the redistribution of wealth, which Leslie Riddock does an awful lot of really good writing on, doesn't she, highlighting yeah. how Scandinavia has got Local much, much narrower in inequalities than Britain, with its yeah. Gini coefficient being one, some of the worst in the world alongside Singapore, etc. You can put that in a constitution that says we demand that our inequalities are, are if not eradicated, they're put at levels that we are comfortable with in the 21st century, as opposed mm -hmm. to scandalised by at the present time, where so many yeah. people in Scotland live with virtually nothing, destitute. And you're quite right to refer to, you know, the current debate about they're going to attack welfare payments and we people on benefits. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I grew up in the 1980s when you had mass unemployment, and the idea that you scapegoated people on the dole you scapegoated people in the poor with the disgusted 90% of the population that realise there, but for the grace of God goes any of us. And these mm -hmm. are not people who are the root of the problem. They are people who deserve to be first in the queue where there's help to be given. And when the economy turns around, their needs must be primary. And I think mm -hmm. that sense you can put in a constitution. And in the independence yes. movement, we can say these are guarantees when we have independence, these are guarantees, because I realise that people are sick to the back teeth of politicians promising them something beforehand, and then when it comes to deliver, oh well, Marlene Fiona, it just wasn't as simple as that. We had to take some tough decisions, and we had to kick poor Mrs McGinty in the teeth because she was asking for an extra 50 pence in her pension. You know, mm. that I'm afraid that's long been part of what people's reality yeah. and their experience has been yeah. with politics you know? yeah and and i mean i think some of what you've been saying are about what well, yeah, national care service uh, an, an nhs that is a you know publicly owned nhs yeah. pensions is another state pensions mm -hmm. is another kind of one uh, yeah i think i think fiona's right land reform because there's, there's nothing worse than the optics of half of scotland being owned by less than 500 people you know yeah and and i i do think it's kind of dereliction of something or other duty probably that the S I know the s and have made F you know they made a start in land reform but having been sitting there in power for such a long time and really they've just started to make a start is you know not exactly inspiring but not these these things years. are all are all sort of values driven aren't they and and that's exactly what would be in in a in a written convention and and then it's up to whoever we you know, the convention stands no matter who we vote in into Holyrood so then it's up to them to take that forward. I mean there is a draft constitution that Mike Russell put together a, a group of folk to, to talk about. I, I was part of that group but I was there representing pensioners for independence and it is actually a really really inspiring document. It's also really difficult to read because it's 50 pages and there's a lot of detail but some of it there's just nuggets of gold in it and yep, I, sure. you know I, I just think that 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 could be something that if we got out a bit more public over the next year and in the run-up to this general election that could just help galvanize some of the yeah, kind yeah, of discussion yeah, yeah. that you know that you've been talking I mean, about I'm, I'm, i mean i'm anxious to say that i think support for independence is below 50 percent maybe 45 percent or so right but I'm optimistic that it's possible to get to 60. Yeah. It's not beyond us. It's not, you know, it's not flights of fancy or anything like this, you know. So that discussion we had about what might or might not be in a constitution, in the constitutional convention, married together with this sense that you can trust. You trust in politics is a really, really important yeah. thing, you know. And yeah. so when you, you look at the question of land reform 
or the housing inequities in Scotland. There's so many of the other inequalities that are there. The thing that strikes you, I'm sure it struck both of you, is this isn't new. We've been saying we need land reform for 50, 60 years. The Crofters unions were arguing for this in the 20s. <laughs> and we've been talking about the need for you know, affordable housing in Scotland for the last 40 years. So you then draw the conclusion, so what's stopping it? Mm. What's the actual vested interests that are clearly powerful enough to say, nope, that's no happening. Nope, that's no happening. And I'm sure it's done, Danny, for you live. One of the obvious problems you've got in building a hundred thousand, they used to be called council housing, now we refer to them as social housing yeah. for rent that people can afford, that are proper quality is. Those people living in a four hundred thousand pound house in Edinburgh are not going to be very happy if all of a sudden that reduces itself to two hundred thousand because there's so many tens of thousands of other cheaper houses in the market. And you both smile quite rightly because we know fine well there's where the resistance lies in part, the house builders and the mortgage consultants and finance capital. It's the people have got into this idea that a fictitious asset is somehow £400,000 they can leave to their son and daughter or leave the house, etc. And not realising uh, many housing bubbles that we see in the last 20 years. You know, this is fictitious. This is the South Sea bubble. Uh, reflected in the 21st century, you know. Yeah, so yeah. there are, what my point about trust is, people have to work out who can you trust to challenge and defeat the vested interests, the Duke of Buccleu who's saying, land reform in the south of Scotland, beat it, it's no happening. Or the Dutch billionaire who owns most of the highlands, beat it with your land reform. No, you can't have Ascent and Egg and Rum and Muck and Tyree because I own it and it's about money. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think what would drive me as a socialist is need is more important than profit. You know, mm -hmm. need is more important than money. And you have to challenge the powers that be to say, listen, you might be a billionaire, but you're stopping thousands of people in Scotland owning their property or having treatment that belongs to the 21st century. I mean, Scotland's land, report, land laws are like the 15th century. They are really prehistoric. We, we've had a week of, or two weeks of conferences, so we were up at the um, Revive one. So you're conference so, groupies, are you? We are this month, yeah. Me too. It's great, great material for podcasts, I tell you. Yeah. So, and you meet a lot of people. But, um, yeah, the, the Revive one, the, there was genuine interest. It started off as people annoyed that raptor birds are being persecuted on grouse moors. And the whole thing has kind of spread and spread and spread. And it has become really about land reform and social mm -hmm. justice, yeah, which I yeah. think is fabulous. And I mean, that there was, what, 700 people at that conference, Very you good. know, which which is brilliant, you know, in Perth. Yeah. And you had to pay. It wasn't just, you know, walking off the street. It was really well attended and yeah. by a huge cross section of people interested in lots of different things that suddenly all came together in that that space and um, some of the debate at even at the SNP conference there with them um, our favorite graham mccormack standing up with his 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 roof and rent proposals now whether or not you think that's a good idea it is still thinking about how can we do something different with our greatest asset for the best you know for the greatest yeah. benefit of our people and um, people could get behind that i think yeah, yeah. and yeah. i mean i think what was what what's an uh, interesting again from that um the one about revive the one about the, the land reform in Perth. Yeah. just had to think work convention when i'm talking about here <laughs> um they they got chris packham up colin to front right, it chris so packham, he, you know yeah. he was introducing people and he was doing wee links and yeah at certain points he was answering some questions as well and i think particularly after leslie ridder had had her 10 minutes kind of slot chris <laughs> realized that not exactly completely gone over into being uh, a day that was about Scottish independence, because it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you've got Leslie talking, then she's going to put it in that context. And mm -hmm. I thought you kind of um, realised from what Chris said afterwards that he'd kind of gone, oh, yes, that would actually, you know, that would solve a lot. That would solve a lot of these problems if we actually had the powers to do something and also had, of course, the will kind of what we're talking about here yeah. But, yeah. but what i was thinking about that day was yeah it started off that whole movement started off because it became pretty obvious that it was on certain grouse moors that 
eagles and other you know raptors were disappearing mm -hmm. and out of that yeah a load of uh, other kind of interests and possibilities have come and all although it, that day wasn't about independence maybe apart from leslie but and craig dale <laughs> oh and us and and yes. and, 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 and the, the common real folk but what it was about was something that you could campaign on and an independence campaigner could campaign on that and, and wrap independence you know around it because yeah. the only way it will happen really happen properly is if we were independent and oh, that's yeah. exactly the same with that survive conference yeah. as well because yeah. Of yeah. climate change and, and nuclear that they just wrap themselves around independence and common will were at that as well and there was a bit where there was the common home plan about how how you could um retrofit everything that you needed to do to achieve net zero here's yeah. the sums here's how long it will take and then at the end but we can only do that with independence so it, it just all doors seem to lead to independence so maybe we are at by not focusing on independence but by focusing on these issues maybe we are making the case by default perhaps yeah. more of well that. you know funny enough i think I, I look at the next year and i expect a labor government next year um ambivalent about it as you know the most right-wing labor government probably in my lifetime uh, they'll get rid of the Tories, um, which is at least something, but not very well, much. for a while, maybe not for yeah, very long. But, but here's the yeah. rub for independence. I think the next year is difficult for the independence movement because Labour's going to get in and people say I'm voting Labour, they get rid of the Tories and therefore if Labour's not in favour of independence, well, that's just tough, etc. But I think this is a crisis Labour government virtually from day one. Here's Stammer's economic policies and the, the state of the economy he'll do nothing about which leads to big social convulsions. His policy in Ukraine is all over the place. His policy in climate change is not to be trusted, etc. And I think what we may well see is the next year might be difficult for the independence movement. The general election, as I say, that uh, the polls would lead you to believe the SNP may lose half their seats in Scotland. But that Labour government is in a crisis. And as you said, so many of the problems that we then say are real to us whether it's about Trident on the Clyde or land reform or reform of the council tax or this, you know, standard of living, etc. Labour will do nothing for working people on that. And so mm -hmm. what's your choice that we have to, you know, expect the Tories to get back in? No, in Scotland, we've got the national question. That's the route for us. Yeah. So what I'm saying is there's Lenin there, is he on that shoulder? And then yeah. Lenin wrote a pamphlet <laughs> called Two Steps Backward, One Step Forward. And that's yeah. what I look at, 2024, ah, yeah. two steps yeah. backward to a Labour government, it's a waste of time. You get rid of the Tories, but their opponents of independence died in the world, unionists. But they're in crisis, and working people in Scotland facing the crisis won't be saying, well, what are we going to do, wait till somebody else gets elected at Westminster? That's a non-event. What, we're going to wait in the Labour left? Oh. Somebody like Corbyn or something? I mean... Keir Starmer has, has essentially gutted the Labour Party of left-wingers. Diane Abbott's effectively expelled, Jeremy Corbyn's expelled. So the idea that you'd wait for some kind of socialist Labour government is, I'm afraid, dead in the water. God knows some of us waited in it a long time ago and it never arrived then. So what my conclusion is that I'm not so much pessimistic or optimistic, but I think the route to independence might be more difficult in the beginning and more profitable and more likely to get an echo later on 2025 2026 when the scottish parliament elections yeah. where the ah, test will be yeah. there's a there's a platform that says hollywood yeah. now we are confident we've got the majority of people in scotland want independence we've demonstrated it in 2026 by electing ssp msps green msps scottish socialist party msps alba whoever and then we say we're taking that democratic majority case to a Labour government and dare you to say that the democratic yeah. will of the Scottish people cannot be achieved if we want yeah. independence. Yeah. So it's a happy ending, at least. That's the most optimistic view of it we've had. That's brilliant. I think that's a strong possibility. That, that's how the, the economic circumstances in Britain may plan out. I, I was listening to you enviously about the conferences you attended. I was at the a CND climate change one in Glasgow a week past on Saturday, but I missed this Saturday there was a break up Britain. Oh yeah, conference. we we've watched it. We saw it on much, live I stream. Watched it, I watched it fully. I mean, it's very much yeah. in the memory of Tom Nairn yeah. and his work and that. Yeah. And that, there's there's something perhaps not to be discussed.
it's not an issue I would necessarily campaign and take my petition in Princess Street four days a week with or go into the schemes about. But the breakup of Britain is posed again and again and again. The British state is in convulsions. It's bra- it would appear to be strengthened in this regard, but the weaknesses in Ireland and the north and the south, the weaknesses in Scotland, the weaknesses in the federal solution that's offered by people like Gordon Brown and Alec Rowley, that doesn't work. So no. they, they've got they you know it's not a stable chemical equation that just sits there. You know there are there's there's convulsions in that, and I think yeah. that's something that's maybe below the surface, but it'll come out like a volcanic oh, eruption yeah. in Iceland. <laughs> we're, we're watching that as well. <laughs> but yeah, I'm yeah. gonna we're, we'll get a good couple of podcasts out of that breakup of Britain thing. There's some very yeah, interesting yeah, themes sure. come out. The what the one that floated up was how you had representatives from Scotland, Wales and Ireland, even yeah. if that was just Leslie, all well down the road of thinking, well, this is how we do it, this is how we do it here, this is what we'd rather do. And the, the English folk on that platform were kind of shell-shocked as if they were having to think for the first time, yeah, oh, yeah. what does that mean for England? And there was a really interesting couple of uh, folk, both of whom had, well, come from our colonial past, but it had led them to being in Britain, although they were both born in London. And both of them were saying, oh, I haven't thought about being English. I'm happy being British, but English, oh, I don't know about that. You know, <laughs> and it was these questions coming up for the first time. I mean, Hilary Wainwright was there, wasn't she? I know yeah. Hilary for a long, long time. And Hilary's one of the few people in England that puts this on the agenda. But I mean, I stayed in London for 10 years earlier on in my life. And the truth is in London, they don't think about anywhere else. They think no. Watford is the north. You know, yeah. I mean, they don't really yeah, care. And true. also, uh, people <laughs> in London in particular, not so much in Yorkshire where my in-laws are or, or of other family that live in Liverpool, but English people tend to think Britain is England. Yeah. England is Britain, you know, and it's understandable because they're 60 million, we're five, Northern Ireland's one and three quarters, Wales is three, right? So I, I forgive them for it, but they really need to do their homework. They really need to realise that the, the proposition, I think, funny enough, they disregard knowingly probably this idea of a federal solution. I remember discussing with Jim Sellers and Alec Rowley and various other people, um, what was her name, Jean Urquhart, who was, I met her just on the oh. weekend. And we were talking about the uh, the idea that's been presented. Stop us to get an independence. Uh, the Earl of Salisbury apparently has some bill that he's prepared to put in front of the House of Commons at any time, proposing a federal structure for Britain so that Scotland <laughs> would in effect devolve all power except foreign affairs and yeah. what was it, macroeconomic policy or something like that, right? And that would be uh, retained at Westminster. And and when you delved into it, you say, yeah, the problem is England already think they are Britain and you'd have to have maybe, what, seven or eight assemblies in England alone, yeah. the north, yeah. the south, the east, yeah. the west, the mountains, yeah. etc. That's just cloud cuckoo land, it's yeah, not going to happen, yeah, that's what yeah, undermines yeah, the idea of a yeah, federal solution. It yeah, might yeah. solve the problem they conceive in Scotland, that it's extra devolution without being independence, but it's like the seesaw, everything falls off the other end of the seesaw, you've got that one weighted down, but the other, the other side of the equation doesn't work. I think that what you were saying about, you know, maybe next year's going to be two steps back and we end up with a Labour government. I mean, it seems odd to kind of be saying it's two steps back to end up the Labour government. Um, we've all three mm. of us have vo- obviously voted for them a lot in the past, but yeah, and then, but but then come the next Holyrood election, that's when we can start moving forward again. I mean, that's uh, I think that's a pretty pragmatic and you know to no, look at. Of us were born yesterday. There's no point pretending that we're the next year will be independent by this time next year. That's just yeah, silly. Yeah, that that counterproductive. Yeah. You set false hope. You know, set hot false horses start running. You must be honest with people. I mean, I'm a great uh, fan of Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, uh, such a fan that the SSP van is named after him. We call it Van Antonio Gramsci. <laughs> the optimism of the, of optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. You must always be honest and truthful about what you see and you must be prepared and have to look straight in the eye, dark consequences if you think they're coming. And as if to illustrate the point, remember Gramsci was murdered by Mussolini. Yeah. He was put in jail for the last 10 years of his life. He never seen any democracy in Italy. He, was, he, he didn't see the Second World War. He was dead by then. 
but he had the perspicacity and the honesty and the deep intellectual conviction to say, this might be difficult and it might be harder before it gets better. But what he had is he's an unquenchable optimism and an unquenchable spirit. He believed in people and their ability and their determination to stand up against injustice. And for us, independence is unjust. Mm -hmm. We're not getting what we want. We're not yeah. getting the kind of country we want. And if the people of Scotland want something, we're damned if anybody's going to stop us. Yeah. And that's the nature yeah. of the challenge yeah. that we face. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah. And that's a lovely positive note to end our interview with Colin on. Thank you so much, Colin, for joining us. Are you going to tell people that having been so taken with the uh, drawing of Lenin behind Colin <laughs> that you went out and got your own one? I did. Well, we were at the... Um the the john mclean lecture which was also hosted by the scottish socialists and we'll give you the link to that as well in the notes and they had merchandise which included a lovely photo a picture a drawing actually painting of lenin so that's now up on my kitchen wall and i'm kind of looking forward to my mother coming up on holiday and seeing it <laughs> <laughs> actually when i after that i got home knowing that you'd got them i did have a look to see if i still possibly had the, the poster of lenin that i actually bought in Moscow in the early 1970s but I suppose Ooh. it would have been a bit miraculous if it was still still around someplace and if it is I can't find it but anyway <laughs> then. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that. We thoroughly enjoyed chatting with Colin. Have a look in our website, scottishindipod.scot, for all our other podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe. We'll catch you later. Bye now.